Hi everyone. Welcome to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at Dialopathology.com. In continuation with the gastrointestinal pathology series, today let's understand the pathogenesis of colorectal cancer. So we will look into epidemiology, the various risk factors and in detail about the pathogenesis of colorectal carcinoma. Now, adenocarcinoma of colon is the most common malignancy of the gastrointestinal tract, which is the major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. And it is responsible for around 10% of all cancer deaths worldwide. Okay, usually it peaks around 60 to 70 years of age. Less than 20% of cases occur before the age of 50, but off late, the incidence of disease before age of 40 is increasing. Now, when I say incidence, it's highest in North America. Of course, Australia, New Zealand, Europe and Japan also have high incidence of colorectal adenocarcinomas. But the incidence in South America, India, Africa and South Central Asia is lower as compared to the other parts of the world. What are all the dietary factors which are implicated with increased risk of colorectal cancer. Two things. One, low intake of unabsorbable vegetable fiber. And two, very high intake of refined carbohydrates and fat. Now, how does these two result in uh, colorectal cancer? Low intake of unabsorbable vegetable fi fiber results in decreased stool bulk and altered composition of intestinal microbiota. Okay, and that leads to increased synthesis of potentially toxic oxidative byproducts of bacterial metabolism. And we know that because of decreased stool bulk, there is decreased motility, and thus these toxidative byproducts remain in contact with the colonic mucosa for longer periods of time, and that results in carcinogenesis that's that has a very high increase risk of cancer the second important thing is that high intake of refined carbohydrates and fat that enhances the hepatic synthesis of cholesterol and bile acid which is further converted to carcinogens by the intestinal bacteria can the colorectal carcinoma be prevented to a certain extent yes one by dietary modification as you mentioned earlier we have to increase the intake of unabsorbable vegetable fiber and decrease the intake of refined carbohydrates second one is chemo prevention where aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs seems to have a protective effect how does that happen that's because of inhibition of the enzyme cox2 so we all know that cox2 is an enzyme responsible in the synthesis of prostaglandin a2 and this prostaglandin you know is the one which is involved or responsible for the epithelial proliferation whenever there is injury Okay, now, so we should know that COX-2 is highly expressed in 90% of colorectal carcinomas and around 40 to 90% of adenomas. So, by taking aspirin and other non-steroidal NSAIDs, because of inhibition of enzyme COX-2, there is some amount of protection offered to the development of colorectal carcinomas. Now, let's look into the molecular events that lead to colonic adenocarcinoma there are two important things we need to consider one is genetic abnormalities second is epigenetic abnormalities now what are these epigenetic abnormalities two things apc or beta catenin pathway the second one is msi or micro satellite instability pathway so this apc or beta catenin pathway is the one which is activated in the classic adenoma carcinoma sequence whereas msi pathway is the one where there is defects in the DNA mismatch repair, which leads to accumulation of mutations in the microsatellite repeat regions of the genome. We will understand this in detail a bit later, right? Now, what are these epigenetic abnormalities? What do you mean by epigenetic abnormalities? These are the factors which are beyond the genetic code, which means there are some external modifications to the DNA that can turn the genes on or off. So one such external modification is methylation. So this methylation can induce gene silencing and that might enhance progression along either of these pathways. Okay. So this epigenetic abnormalities can be a part of these two pathways as well. So methylation induced gene silencing can occur in these genes as well. Now let's look into in detail about the APC or beta catenin pathway. This is the classical adenoma carcinoma sequence which accounts for up to 80% of sporadic cancers where there will be mutation of 
APC gene early in the neoplastic process. Now, what is this APC gene? This is adenomatous polyposis coli gene, which is often referred to as the gatekeeper of colonic neoplasia. So, this is a tumor suppressor gene, which functions by down-regulating the growth-promoting signaling pathways. Basically, you know, it stops or, you know, down-regulates down these signaling pathways, which are growth-promoting, thereby hindering proliferation. Now, whenever there is germline loss of function mutations involving the APC gene, at the long arm of chromosome number 5, these are often associated with familial adenomatous polyposis. Now, what is this condition? This is an autosomal dominant disorder where there will be hundreds and thousands of adenomatous polyps throughout the large intestine and one of these polyps will invariably turn malignant. That means there is 100% of, 100% chances of the familial adenomatous polyposis transforming into malignancy. Not only these germline mutations, it's also seen that the non-familial colorectal carcinomas as well as sporadic adenomas, they are also involved. They also show acquired defects involving the APC gene. So, which means to say that APC is an important gene in the pathogenesis of colorectal carcinoma. Okay. Now, this APC or adenomatous polyposis gene, which encodes for a protein called APC protein, it is a component of the WNT signaling pathway. So, we will understand what is this WNT signaling pathway. Okay. This is a pathway where which, which has a role in controlling cellular growth and differentiation during the embryonic development. Okay. So, let's understand this pathway in detail by knowing what happens in a resting colonic epithelial cell. Consider that this is a colonic epithelial cell. That's a plasma membrane. That's a nucleus. This is a receptor for the WNT molecules. So, in the cell where there is no proliferation, what is what what's happening inside these cells? So, basically, there is APC and beta catenin combined together okay, to form a destruction complex where these beta catenin molecules are broken down by means of proteosomal degradation. So, APC, APC protein is the one which is responsible for the breakdown of these beta catenin molecules. Because these beta catenin molecules or proteins are broken down, no more beta catenin available and thus there is no translocation of this beta catenin into the nucleus, no transcription and no proliferation. That's why these resting colonic epithelial cells, there is no proliferation. That's because of formation of destruction complex with the help of APC protein. Now, what, have, what is this WNT stimulation? So, we have these WNT molecules. When these molecules combine or attaches to the receptor of the WNT, that sends a signal to this complex where there is deactivation of the destruction complex. The WNT signals deactivation of the destruction complex, thereby over a period of time, more and more beta catenin accumulates in the cytoplasm. These accumulated beta catenin then translocates into the nucleus, the binds to the TCF to form the transcription activation complex. Now, this is a transcription activation complex where there is activation of transcription factors like the MYC, cyclin D1, etc., which leads to proliferation of colonic epithelial cells. So, this is a WNT signaling pathway, right? Now, what happens if there is mutation of APC gene? When there is mutation of APC gene, that means there is no proper formation of APC protein or there is improper, there is abnormal APC protein where there is no formation of destruction complex. So, if there is no formation of destruction complex, beta catenin cannot be degraded. So, which means to say that more and more beta catenin accumulates, then it translocates, binds to TCF, then there is transcription and there is proliferation. So, absence of APC protein functions just like WND signaling. There is continuous stimulus to these cells and thus, thus there is continuous proliferation. If APC is normal and you have beta catenin mutation, again it is the same thing. If there is a beta catenin mutation, then these beta catenin do not bind with APC protein and no formation of complex again and thus the same cycle continues. So, whether it is APC mutation or whether there is beta catenin mutation, the end result is same. The end result is proliferation of colonic epithelial cells. To summarize, this is a resting 
colonic epithelial cell where there is no proliferation. WNT stimulation, there is proliferation as you saw and APC mutation or beta catenin mutation, there is proliferation. Right now we understood the concepts of APC gene, the APC protein, and the beta catenin. Right, so APC protein. Now we know that it is a key negative regulator of beta catenin, where it promotes degradation, counteracts the proliferation, and that's thus there is no proliferation, and that's why it is referred to as tumor suppressor protein. Whereas beta catenin, th this being a central component of double bond signaling pathway, it is the one which is, which is responsible for cell proliferation, differentiation and apoptosis. So this is basically a proto-oncoprotein. Now uh, having understood these two you know, concepts, let us see what happens in a APC beta catenin pathway. So consider that this is a normal mucosa. This normal mucosa, whenever there is a germline mutation, it can be inherited or a somatic mutation, acquired mutations of the cancer suppressor genes, particularly we are we'll, we'll, talking about APC gene at long arm of chromosome 5. This is the first hit. Now, as per Nutson hypothesis, you know that there has to be two hits for the gene to be completely inactivated, right? So, this becomes mucosa at mucosa now is at risk for development of subsequent neoplastic process. Now, this mucosa, if there is a second hit, this second hit can be because of inactivation of normal alleles or it can be because of epigenetic factors, that means methylation abnormalities. Now, whatever is the reason, once there is second hit, okay, so that results in the formation of early adenoma. Now, when these early adenomatous cells when they have these proto-oncogene mutations like KRAS mutations which promote growth and prevent apoptosis. Also, there can be homozygous loss of additional cancer suppressor genes. Okay, For example, a loss of heterozygosity at long arm of chromosome 18. It could be SMAD2 and 4 or even overexpression of COX2. So that finally results in the development of late adenoma because these are the ones which allow unrestrained cell growth. Now these late adenomatous cells, at this point, if you have T53 mutation, and this is located in the short term of chromosome number 17, when you have T53 mutation, that is the one which results in the development of carcinoma. Now you can have accumulation of more and more mutations even in these carcinomatous cells. The additional mutations, cross chromosomal alterations, for example, you know, expression of telomerase, other cancer genes mutations. This is the one which results in progression of cancer as well as the metastasis. Now this is a classical adenoma carcinoma sequence. Remember the genes, APC gene, KRAS gene, TP53 gene and telomerase ones which basically results in tumor progression. There is a mnemonic to remember AK53, A for APC gene, K for KRAS and TP53 in the final stage of development of carcinoma. The second important genetic uh, factor is this MSI pathway. MSI stands for microsatellite instability. Now, what are these microsatellites? What are these microsatellite repeats? These are basically short segment of DNA, one or six or more base pairs in length, which repeats multiple times in succession, okay, in a given DNA molecule. Now, most often located in the non-coding part of the genome, for example, TA, 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 these are basically a dinucleotide microsatellite. The second example being GTC, 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 which are trinucleotide microsatellite. So there can be tetranucleotide microsatellite, there can be pentanucleotide microsatellite and so on. Now what is this instability? What is this microsatellite instability? So this is a condition of genetic hypermutability. Now what does that mean? That's because of impaired DNA mismatch repair. Whenever there is a mutation in the DNA mismatch repair genes and there is accumulations of mutations in these microsatellite repeat region. And that condition is referred to as microsatellite instability. Now let us see how this is implicated in colorectal carcinoma. Normal mucosa, whenever there is a germline or inherited or somatic mutation of mismatch repair genes, for example, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS1 and PMS2, alteration of second allele by loss of heterozygosity or mutation or even promoter methylation. This again is a epigenetic modification. So all these things results in the mucosa being at risk for development of neoplasia. 
Now, the second important event is whenever such accumulation occurs over a period of time, accumulation of these mismatch mutations in the microsatellite repeats, as we told you earlier, this is now known as microsatellite instability. Now, this becomes a microsatellite instability mutator phenotype, and this is the one which results in the development of a condition called a sessile serrated adenoma. The name sessile serrated adenoma is because the, uh, the mucosa shows serrations. This architecture is very characteristic and that's why it's referred to as sessile serrated adenoma. In the sessile serrated adenoma, when there is accumulated mutations in genes that regulate growth, differentiation and apoptosis, for example, when there is mutation involving the transforming growth factor B receptor 2, when there is mutation involved in the bags which are involved in apoptosis or BRF mutations or TCF4 mutations or insulin-like growth factor receptor mutations, all these mutations can accumulate and finally leads to the development of carcinoma. This is the MSI or microsatellite instability pathway. Now, this is what we learned, right? We learned about these two genetic abnormality. Now, let us see what are these epigenetic abnormalities. Okay. The epigenetic abnormalities, we all know that it is methylation induced gene silencing. That's what I told you earlier, right? So, in APC or beta catenin pathway, there is methylation of CPG rich, jo rich zones are CPG islands within the phi dash region. Now, what are these CPG islands? These are the regions of the genome that contain large number of CG dinucleotide repeats. Now, they are located within or close to gene promoters. And that's why, you know, just remember that these normally CG islands or CPG islands are unmethylated in the normal DNA. Now, when these unmethylated islands undergo methylation results in silencing of tumor suppressor genes. Now, let's see what is the epigenetic abnormality in the MSI pathway. Sometimes, you know, there can be microsatellite instability without mutations in the DNA mismatch repair enzymes. In these cases, you know, they demonstrate the CPG island again, this CPG island hypermethylation phenotype. Again, the same thing happens. There is hypermethylation of the CPG islands where MLH1 promoter region is typically hypermethylated. We know that MLH1 is an important DNA mismatch repair gene, right? So that promoter region is typically hypermethylated, resulting in reduction of MLH1 expression and repair function. In this type of carcinoma, BRF mutation is more common. So these carcinomas have three things. One, microsatellite instability, hypermethylation of CPG island and BRF mutation. And the last one is there are some small group of tumors where they display increased methylation of CPG islands in the absence of microsatellite instability. In these tumors, KRAS mutation is common. Now, if you feel the things are a bit complicated, just remember that there are genetic abnormalities, epigenetic abnormalities. Genetic abnormalities, APC or beta catenin pathway or an MSI pathway. Epigenetic abnormalities, one word you remember, methylation or hypermethylation and that results in gene silencing. APC or beta catenin pathway activated in colonic classic adenoma carcinoma sequence, MSI meaning microsatellite instability. Now, is there any association between the genetic defects and the morphology of the cancers? Yes, there are correlations which have been associated with mismatch repair deficiency and microsatellite instability. So, malignancies with these type of mutations, you know, they are frequently located in the right side of the colon. They are common in serrated lesions. I mean, these type of, you know, uh, genetic abnormalities, they are common in serrated lesions and cancers arising from these type of serrated lesions. That's what we saw, right? And they also have prominent mucinous differentiation where you find pools of mucin and very prominent peritumoral lymphocytic infiltrate. Now, that's all about the pathogenesis of colorectal carcinoma. We looked into uh, epidemiology, we thought of, we talked about risk factors and tried to understand the concepts of pathogenesis involved in colorectal carcinoma. So if you have liked this video, hit the like button. Do comment if you have any queries and also in the comment section, please try to mention the difficult topics which you want me to explain. Don't forget to subscribe and do share if you find this video useful. Thank you.